So over the last two days, uh, we looked at their work from different angles in different clusters in terms of conflict resolution, in terms of health, in terms of uh, election observation, and um, and the final session um, probably kept the best to the last session. And, and for that, uh, this is going to be one of the conversations that we were having throughout those two days. And that was really the kind of like the, uh, the way we wanted the, this whole event to be a conversation. Celebration through conversation, because that's the best way of really unpacking this amazing legacy that they had. Because, um, and I feel that, to be honest, like, you know, um, all these thematic areas, we zoomed in kind of different aspects, like um, the, the, um, the uh, conflict resolution work they, uh, they did, Camp David, of course, et cetera. But I still feel that, you know, we scratched the surface. Mm. And that is, I think, you know, the reality that we need to accept. And But nevertheless, this last session, A President's Legacy, uh, we will have another conversation. And for that, I'm really honored um, to have to welcome Governor Terry McAuliffe, the 72nd uh, Governor of Virginia. And, uh, and this conversation will be facilitated by fellow Dean Mark Rozelle. So let me start with the introduction, and then I'll start with uh, Mark. Uh, he is the founding dean of the Shar School of Policy and Government here at George Mason University. He holds the Ruth and John Hazel Chair in Public Policy. Um, he's a prolific author. He, he's the author and co-author of 13 books and editor of 20 additional books on various topics in U.S. government and politics, including presidency, religion and politics, media and politics, uh, southern politics and interest groups in elections. Uh, Mark, you know, I, I can't believe that you have any time to do your job as a dean. Uh, <laughs> it's a kind of like this amazing kind of like collection of publications. Um, and um, our um, guest of honor, uh, Terry McAuliffe, uh, he was sworn in as governor of Virginia uh, in 2014, January uh, uh, 11th. Uh, McAuliffe is a businessman, entrepreneur, and father who has lived in Fairfax County, Virginia, for more than 20 years. He is the son of Jack McAuliffe, who was an army captain in World War II, and Millie McAuliffe, who raised McAuliffe and his three brothers. In order to help pay for college, McAuliffe started a business paving driveways for neighborhood neighbors and local businesses at the age of 14. Since then, he has worked with and led numerous businesses in diverse sectors of the economy, helping to improve companies and create economic opportunity. In politics and business, McAuliffe has worked with people from all walks of life and different political backgrounds. And Governor, when I read your uh, bio, your short resume, and the way you introduce yourself and what you include there really resonates with me. And I'm the first gen um, student in my family. And, uh, and what you did, you know, to build your life and yourself and being the real agent of that success, uh, that's just amazing because I come across many kind of bios, the people, the way they um, present themselves. But yours is a story that, well, this is a success as a result of my parents, my family. And that's just so wonderful, so heartwarming. And um, so with that note, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm leaving you with our governor, Terry McAuliffe, and Dean Roselle. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Hey. All right. So they told me they'd put the mic on. You can hear? Great. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted you're here. Uh, Terry McAuliffe, as well as being former governor, um, situates in the Shar School as a visiting professor. Thank you, Terry. Um, distinguished visiting professor. 
but uh, but uh, but also we're here to talk about the legacy of the Carters, and he was the national campaign finance director for President Carter's reelection campaign in 1980, when he was 22 years of age. Now I know what I was doing when I was 22, and it was not uh, raising money for the incumbent president's reelection. How how did that happen? Yeah, so. Um... I'm actually going to show you a picture back then. At some point, they'll put it up of me back in 1979. I, um, fun story, I was living, I was going to law school, and I was going to law school, and I'd been about a week in the law school, and I had a buddy who was living with a big group house, was working for, there we go, look at that. Yep. 44 years ago. I haven't changed a bit since then. <laughs> That was the convention in New York in 1980. We had a great time. Anyways, he came home. They needed people uh, helping on the campaign. I'd had a scholarship to go to Georgetown Law School. And I thought, you know, I can always go to law school. Mm -hmm. So I called my mother, told her I was leaving after a week, quitting law school, forfeiting my scholarship to go work for Carter, who at the time, the opportunity for his reelect looked dismal. Right. But- to me, it was a great opportunity. I left law school, ended up going to travel, Mark, probably to 40 states. Mm. I'm 22, 23 years old, became the number one fundraiser for the president. Wow. I got paid $13,000 a year and uh, then became the national finance director for the general election. So great experience. Mm -hmm. Great man. I loved him. Loved his wife, Rosalind. And, you know, Walter Mondale was great and his wife, Joan. So as a young 22, 23-year-old, uh, traveling around the country, meeting with the president of the United States vice president. I mean, I grew up, you know, I was starting my first business because, you know, my folks couldn't afford to send me to college. All of a sudden, I'm now at the White House. It was yep. a great experience, a lot of fun. That's pretty heady stuff. Yeah. yeah. So let me talk, let me ask you um, about the Carter legacy. Um, so this little book of mine, 35 years ago, the Press and the Carter presidency, that was my doctoral dissertation. So I'll mention I write a book occasionally. Um, but it's been out of print for about 34 of those 35 years, so I'm not so I'm not so I'm not selling books. Um, but in doing the research, I I came away thinking this was a man who was very misunderstood in his time while he was in office by those who were tasked with the duty on a daily basis of evaluating the performance of an incumbent president. And I, I wanted to talk to you about that since you knew him and you were there at the time. Um, is history going to be more kind to this president? the way it has been to Truman, Eisenhower. Is there a different story about Jimmy Carter and his legacy um, from those who know him best than what the contemporary analysts of his time have said and others? Yeah, and, and, and you got to remember when he first ran in 1976, he ran as the outsider. You know, he was a peanut farmer from Plains, Georgia. He'd been a state senator. He had been governor. Um he served on the Sea Wolf, which was only the second nuclear sub in U.S. naval history, and ran as an outsider, primarily because the atmosphere, you had Richard Nixon, obviously had resigned the presidency. You had Spiro Agnew had committed tax fraud. So he had all of these issues out there. Carter comes in as an honest guy from the South, peanut farmer, man of the people. If you remember his old campaign posters, you know, he had the farm closing and, and you know. Yep. And so he comes in. And, you know, listen, maybe some staffing decisions probably could have been better. Uh, so he comes into Washington, no real relationship with, quote, the Washington establishment, right. the leadership of the House and the Senate. And then he immediately tries to get rid of pork barrel projects for members of the United States Congress. Right. Probably not the best way to come in and endear yourself to the Congress, whom you need to vote on all of your things, on the SALT II yep. Treaty, on your energy policies. And that sort of alienated, and, you know, remember Tip O'Neill called Hamilton, Jordan Hamilton, Jordan sure. in and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, it got to the point that, you know, but on the other hand, he came in, and you look at the accomplishments uh, that this president had, clearly the Camp David Accord, which I'm sure you've heard about here for two days, it obviously his number one uh, achievement. He did the SALT II Treaty. Um, he opened up China. I mean, Nixon started it, but it was, you know, the, it was President Carter who actually moved in and, you know, did the whole issue with Taiwan and established the relationship. So, and his energy policy, which at the time hurt him badly mm -hmm. because we had gas prices that went up, but, 
you know, the whole synthetic corporation, he started that as president. He was the first president to talk about solar. Remember, he put solar panels on the White House, which Ronald Reagan came in and took down like in the first week. He used to wear the cardigan sweater because he kept the temperature like at 12 degrees in the White House. I mean, you know, he was trying to send the message, but he leaned in on these big issues uh, and was very successful when you think of his presidency. He was a very serious, obviously very, very smart, but got out of bed trying to think, I want to do the best things. I'm not going to play politics. And that hurt him, I think, with the Congress. But mm-hmm. he was able to get all these things pushed through. Yeah. Did, did you see a turning point in his presidency? Public opinion turned pretty strongly against him uh, at a certain point, right? Yeah. Um, you where, was, feel it in the campaign. Yeah. yeah. Well, so you had gas prices that went up. Right. The other issue he had to deal with, he did um, obviously did not let the Olympic athletes go um, after the invasion by Russia into Afghanistan. And I think it was Canada, West Germany, and us. There were only three or four countries. And that hurt. So you had all these companies who had invested. Yep. Uh, we couldn't go to Russia to do the Olympics. You had all these athletes. You know, that sort of set in. But the gas prices and then inflation roared in because OPEC doubled the cost uh, of a barrel of oil. So now you got inflation sky high, gas prices. We, you're all so young, you won't remember this, but we actually had a time under the Carter presidency, depending on your license plate, odd or even, which day you could go get gasoline. Young people, I try to tell my five children this, they think I'm nuts. <laughs> that you actually could not just go get gas anytime you wanted, but it was dependent. So he had all of that. And then, of course, was the Iranian hostage situation, which every day, this is how Ted Koppel became famous, you know, every night. And I can remember, folks, you got to remember a week out from the election against Reagan. And in full disclosure, we all wanted Reagan to be our opponent. You know, we all thought he was crazy and was going to launch nuclear weapons and all right. kinds of stuff. I mean, yeah, I always say be careful what you wish for. And a week out from that election, Carter was up four or five points. Yeah. And then the Friday before the Tuesday election, we had another false flag came out that they were going to release the hostages within 24 hours. Right. People's hopes got up. And then by Saturday evening, they came out and said, no, no, we're not releasing them. They're not. And I'm telling you, we cratered overnight. The president was flying out to the Pacific Northwest and Pat Cadell was on the plane with them out, I think Sunday out and landing in Washington state. And he told them that the, that the bottom had fallen out of the polling numbers. Yeah. And it was over then. So gas prices, inflation, the Olympic boycott, I think, hurt him. He gave the Malays speech, and then finally the Iranian hostage thing, and it just. And then, as we all find out, I'm sure you've all read recently. Actually, a good friend of mine, Ben Barnes, who former lieutenant governor of Texas, Democrat, he went with John Connolly. He finally admitted, came out in the last two months, yeah. that they went tromping all over the Middle East uh, to tell uh, the Iranians not to release the hostages until. Jimmy Carter was no longer president. Yeah. And election day was the one year anniversary of the taking of the hostages. And that was the lead story in the papers on election day. Back at a time in America when election day was when people voted for president, you know that. So, (laughs) yeah. How about the debate a week before, too? You know, know, we were tracking that. They all talk about it. You know, Reagan, there you go again and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think what it did, Mark, was make Reagan seem not crazy, (laughs) right? reasonable enough to be president. We're madder and heck at all this stuff going on. Let's try something new. Right. So I think that more than anything else, that the guy just didn't look like he was nuts. You know, this actor who played the, whatever it was, bamboozle with the monkey and- Oh, yes. What was it again? Bonzo? Bonzo. Bedtime for Bonzo. Bedtime for Bonzo. Yes. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> you know, yeah, but Carter, to answer your question, Carter, and you know, when he went into hot, when he did hospice, I don't know, what, six months ago, remember everybody, I planned, everybody planned to go to the funeral, like within a week, basically at the end of the day, what the president basically said is I'm not going back to the hospital anymore. Mm-hmm. That's it. And he probably could be alive for another year or so, but you saw after that statement, mm-hmm. oh my God, the most glowing press you've ever seen. Yeah. 
Yep. And I talked to the president. I said, this is brilliant. You should have done this like five years ago. <laughs> but he did a lot of great things. I say, you know, obviously the deal with Israel and Egypt folks, just historic. And you think about it in today's perspective where we are, you know, what he did in China, what he did on energy, what he did on the SALT Treaty with Brezhnev, um, you know, and then, the, of course, the Camp David Accords to give the Sinai back. I mean, think how complicated that was. And, you know, very impressive in a four-year presidency. Right. So um, getting back to the theme of what I was writing many years ago, was it, a, was it in part a communications problem and inability of that White House to focus a message, package it in such a way that told the story of what that president was doing? Because as you're pointing out in retrospect, there were some really significant, important achievements of those four years in office. And yet he left with low public approval, got wiped out in the Electoral College, right? Uh, Republicans for about the next generation every four years ran against Jimmy Carter, even though someone else was on the on the ballot running for the presidency yeah. in the Democratic Party. Yeah, they clearly could, you know, in hindsight, and I think it was Pat Cadell, the poll show, had him do it, the, the whole Malay speech. Americans yeah. don't want to be told, you know, that we're failures or, you know, the country's in decline. They don't want to hear that. Right. So that was probably when he went up to Camp David and they planned it that weekend, came down, gave that speech. He probably should not have done it. They could have done a better job at selling. But I just, I just having been there in that campaign, every day, Ted Koppel, every night, day 222, the Iranian hostages. Day 223. So yeah. Yeah. overcome it. And one thing you'll find interesting, so I'm obviously in charge of all the fundraising for his campaign. Jimmy Carter did not campaign personally for his own reelection. I never saw him once on the campaign trail. Yeah. He did the Rose Garden strategy with the hostages being, you know, he said, I'm not going to do politics. Yeah. To this day and age, think of the president of the United States not campaigning for himself. So we had Rosalind Carter, we had Walter Mondale, yep. we had the cabinet, but we did not have the president of the United States campaigning for his own reelection. He made a pledge, not knowing, I believe, how long that yeah. crisis would happen, right? that he was not going to engage in partisan campaign politics while the Americans were being held hostage in Tehran. And of course, he couldn't pull it back. He couldn't take it no. back. Yeah. And, and listen, their negotiations early on, if, if you read all the data on the Iran, Iranian hostage situation, the Ayatollah did not even know that the students were going to invade our embassy. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, the Ayatollah was against it. Yep. So the folks who read the, led the revolution to take over Iran to push the Shah out, and then they got mad. Obviously, the Shah went to Mexico, and then President, because he was a, you know, I mean, we should also mention his human rights, something he did. But when the Shah went to Mexico and had cancer, they wanted the Shah be allowed to come to America for cancer treatments. Yeah. Probably a horrible political yep. decision for President Carter, but President Carter said no. He was our ally. And, you know, in fairness, we and Britain put the shot in power, clearly, if you look at the history of Iran, uh, for oil. Okay. And now he gets thrown out of his country, and President Carter said, no, he's going to get treatments here. So he brought him in, and that really hurt him Yeah, uh, when he allowed the shot, because the negotiations early on with the White House and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and the new leadership, the regime, they wanted to get. They wanted to get these Americans out ASAP. They didn't want them. They wanted money released from us. Mm -hmm. But then, like when he let the shot in, and then it just they couldn't get them out. Yeah. And then the, we should also mention the rescue mission. I mean, it just a sandstorm in our helicopters. Actually, actually, if that mission had been successful, what would have been the outcome? He would have been president of the United States again. Right. Because you had just the idea that our military, that helicopters ran into each other. But if we had rescued, are you kidding me? There would have been parades in every mm -hmm. city in America. Yep. And he would have won again. I just want to remember that election, four or five days out, Carter was up. Yeah. It wasn't the blowout that it ultimately turned out to be, but as, as we discussed what happened over the weekend. So I'll needle you on one point. William Sapphire called it the Malay speech. That word never appeared in that speech. Yeah. And that and that became the touchstone that everybody kept coming back to using the word Malays. And there's no Malays ever uttered in that speech. So it was called the crisis of confidence speech. 
I guess I'm enough of a nerd about this era in Jimmy Carter's presidency that I've read that in detail, analyzed it, you know, and it's a remarkable speech in some in some ways. I th you're absolutely right. The country wasn't ready for the message. But this idea of the president of the United States holding up for 11 days, inviting in theologians and philosophers and uh, public intellectuals and past public officials and trying to, you know, like a physician, diagnose the condition of the country and express what is going on, right? And the initial reaction was actually quite positive. Um, you know, the polling they did within the first 48 hours, but then what did he do? He fired his cabinet. He fired the cabinet. Yeah. Mistake. Yeah. It just looked like the government was in crisis. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I just wonder, was it the speech or was it the sequence of, yeah, so many things. In fact, of all of it, but even with all of it, going back to my point, we were up five days before the election. That Iranian thing at the end, it just had been, they're being released, they're not being released, they're being released, they're not being this went on for, you know, 444 days. Yeah. And by the end, they said, ah, we're going to fire the cabinet. Yep. Yeah. There you go. So, um, well, I don't want to be the last program about the legacy of Jimmy Carter talking about the one thing that the Carter people don't want to talk about, the 1980 campaign. But he was the financial finance director for the 1980 yeah. campaign. So I had to go there. Um, but what I want to talk about uh, in the time we have left, um, the remarkable post-presidency yeah. of this man. Um, I, I mean, did you stay in touch with the former president for, for many years? And yeah, yeah. so well, you'd go down to, uh, and then clearly went out and, you know, he was, he was, he's a great guy. I mean, he just literally, he was simple. I mean, you go down to Plains, Georgia. I mean, he'd go out, go down to the ice cream shop, you know, like just, in fact, he took Rosalind there the other day for ice uh, cream on his uh -huh. recent birthday. I mean, that's the kind of guy he was, but you know, the habitat for humanity, the home building. So he would have these every year, bring everybody back together. And mm -hmm. he, you know, I mean, he got into stuff, guinea, the guinea worm. And oh, this is my idea of a weekend, you know, sitting down there talking about the guinea worm, but whatever. He really, <laughs> I mean, he got excited about that kind of stuff. So he had a great post-presidency. I, I will argue, and Stu Eisenstadt wrote a tome about this big end up there. Yeah. I, I will argue. I mean, we haven't mentioned the Panama Canal. Right. He got the Panama Canal yeah. Treaty done, but yeah. the energy as we know it today, you know, he had tremendous, tremendous success. But for the Iranian thing, uh, he would have won re-election, and his post-presidency, I think, has been a model mm -hmm. for presidents uh, once they get out of office, for sure. Yeah. What about any lessons for the contemporary presidency in American politics, looking back at the... Uh... Well, with what's going on, right, in this country right now, maybe it's a tough question to answer. But, um, the point, this the one, I don't think Donald Trump's post-presidency has been the same as Jimmy Carter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an understatement. Leave that alone. I'll leave that <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, the importance of character, for example, um, yeah. you know, human rights. I mean, the things, the things that he personally deeply cared about um, that maybe did not comport with the political moment at times, but yet he believed in it. Yeah. Um, and we elected such a man. Could there could there have been a Carter presidency under any circumstance than the immediate post-Watergate era? Was that just like the most impossible thing to have happened except for the particular context of what this country had been going through um, in, the, in the immediate post-Nixon and uh, Ford era? I, I think if Carter had run in 2020 against Trump, mm -hmm. uh, Carter would have won. Uh, sort of the same sort of, we're looking for someone with character, uh, like Biden, you know, somebody who can relate to people. So, I, you know, I think, I think, listen, the military, as I say, he was on nuclear subs. He went to the U.S. Naval Academy. Um, you know, I think who Carter was and the message he had about honesty and integrity in government. I think that message, honestly, Mark, still works to this day. Governor, with your um, tremendous experience with the Clinton administration, particularly with the Irish, in, Irish issue in Northern Ireland, how would you compare the legacy of Clinton to the legacy of Carter in regards to the Middle East versus the, the Northern Ireland issue? 
Yeah, so, good question. I think, Bobby, they both took on very difficult, very entrenched international situations. For Carter to take on uh, trying to bring peace to Egypt and Israel back in the in the 70s was just unthought of. I mean, obviously, they had just gone through the war, 67. I mean, they were all fighting over there. But he was, you know, locked him up at Camp David, and he was able and to get, you know, Israel to give back, you know, the top part of the Sinai Peninsula. I mean, historic. Nobody thought that was possible. And that was Carter. Yeah. Uh, literally at Camp David, literally every detail negotiating that. I think fast forward for President Clinton on a uh, very difficult situation between obviously England and Ireland. Uh, in fact, I just traveled with the president and Hillary to uh, Belfast for the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Accords, which still to this day, 25 years later, is still in effect. It's historic. Mm-hmm. Nobody thought that could happen. And it was the same thing. Clinton for hours and hours on end with George Mitchell and working with the the government of England and Ireland to get them to come together to sign it. So both of those, it's a good point in the sense that neither one of those situations would have occurred were not the personal president investing their personal capital and being able to bring people together. And, you know, President Clinton got very close to getting another peace deal in the Middle East, literally right up to the end. In fact, um, if you've read my books, you've got 13, only got two. But, you know, I was at dinner with Yasser Arafat setting up a meeting the next day with the president. President Arhud Barak, who is the prime minister of Israel, put the best deal he'd ever see deal with the Palestinians that President Clinton. But President Clinton knew every street. Who lived on these streets where you're moving the holy sites? I mean, that's just who he was. And we got so close, and Arafat really, I mean, you think where we are today, where the world would be different, and the king of Saudi Arabia was calling Arafat, take the deal, take the deal, take the deal. And he was scared to take the deal. It's unfortunate. But going to your point, it's really those presidents leaning in, not being shy to take on, on a very tough, obviously in the Middle East, obviously in Northern Ireland, and, and they both got agreements, which to this day are still in effect. Pretty historic. I mean, think of Carter also taking on the Panama Canal. I yeah. mean, yeah. they're going to give, he just felt the, the Panamanians, this is their territory. You know, we've got this canal through the middle of your country. He just felt that they should have it back. I mean, Reagan ran a whole presidential campaign in 76 on that issue alone. Exactly. He almost knocked off an incumbent president for re- right. for renomination on the Panama Canal issue. Yeah, well, think of that. Yeah, we we stole it fair and square. But right? was it the, was that the line? <laughs> That's somebody who says I'm president of the states. I'm getting out of bed. I'm going to do the right thing yep. and let the politics be damned. That was definitely Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Thank you very much for your discussion. It's fantastic. Um, I was I wanted to ask. Uh, my name, by the way, is Don Plonke, and uh, I don't have any credentials really around here, except that I'm a retired uh, professor of geography. But um, I was wondering, when you were discussing some of the issues that President Carter had in 1980 with trying to get reelected, yeah. and I recall, as a, as a voter, another uh, problem that, we, that he was more or less a victim of in the political environment was that he was perceived in 1980 by even people at his own party as being not liberal enough, as being sort of moderate to conservative, especially because Edward Kennedy yeah, took him on. I should have brought that yeah, up. And Edward Kennedy took him on, and that, was, that resulted in a a convention that was split, and there was not that unified party going out of the convention. If you recall, uh, uh, Ted Kennedy wouldn't shake his hand at the end of the, yeah. his uh, acceptance speech and so forth. So I just wanted what your opinion was about the state of the Democratic Party at that time that was partly the reason for his loss in the election. No, that's a great point. I should have raised that issue because I lived through it. So, um, it was tough. So here you have the president of the United States running for re-election. 
you have the scion of the Democratic Party, the liberal of the Senate, the liberal lion, Teddy Kennedy, challenging a president of your own party. And I and, and, and I knew good friends, was very good friends with Senator Kennedy, good Irish Catholic and all that. And, and the damage that that did to us all the way through, really through the whole campaign, but clearly through the convention uh, in New York. We were back in New York again for that convention. And, but it, it tied everything up. So we had, we went through these primaries, we went through the whole list of primaries, which was very contentious for an incumbent Democrat running against another Democrat running against him, made it very difficult. And then of course the convention where you read all the books and Teddy'd been out having some fun and he didn't want to come back to the to the convention hall, and then they finally got him on the podium, and poor Carter chasing him around. It was just, it was awful. And that's a good point. And, you know, had Kennedy not run, I would also make the argument that Carter probably would have won re-election. It was such a distraction. I can't tell you uh, for a year. Now, people say to me, and I'm very good friends with President Biden's, I've known him for 40 years, and, uh, oh, Democrats should run against him for this reason or that reason. And I always give the example. Teddy Kennedy tried this back in 1980, and it didn't work out so well. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. But it's a good point. And, and he got beat pretty bad in the primaries, one after another, but he just wouldn't give up. Wouldn't give up. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Literally went to the convention floor fighting for delegates in August 1980. To change the rule to open the convention yeah. and undo all the primaries. Yeah. He, vote, he he tried to get a rules change at the convention so that the results of the primaries wouldn't count and the delegates could change. And the guy in charge of delegate counting then was so was the young man who I lived with who got me first, a guy named Tom Donnellan, <laughs> who ended up being National Security Advisor for President Obama. He was okay. in charge of the delegates that wow. day. But you're right. They tried to, you know, for the convention, and so when right— up to the end, and it just it was so damaging. It split our party. Uh, Governor, my name is Mark Gopin. I'm one of the faculty here at Carter School. A number of us, this is about a recommendation from you, our advice, because you're so, you were so on the ground in these moments. So we've, we've celebrated President Carter for two days. It's fine for us to go into a little bit of, uh, of, of a learning from that ill-fated speech about the environment and about oil and What's your advice? I, I and others, Solon Simmons, we work on the, the power of the word and the power of the word to push psychology in one direction or another, the frames. So what do you recommend out of that lesson and learning experience about what, what a democratic or progressive approach to change should, should sound like in terms of the words, the frames, what works, uh, what are the lessons taken away? Yeah. And I will tell you this, every year and every campaign is different. Look at the environment we're in today. I mean, it just makes you sick to your stomach. What's going on in this country, the division, the, the hatred, the split. Um, you know, and I say this very publicly, I blame people like Fox TV every day for splitting this country. We are the greatest nation on earth. You know, I travel. I think I've been 18 countries this year. There is nothing like coming back to the United States of America. What are you complaining about? But every day it's driven on TV and social media. The false stories, the false narratives that they put out. So the positive news, a lot of times, be honest with you, it's hard to get any resonance with it because false news and false stories that incite people are really at the forefront of American politics today. We won in 2020. Um, I always said I was on TV for a year on CNN, saying that Joe Biden was going to win the nomination. I always felt it because I knew our party needed to coalesce to beat Trump. We, this nation could not afford four more years of Donald Trump, and that's exactly what happened. We coalesced. Joe was a good guy, the average Joe, blah, 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 talking about how we lift people up. I still think the positive message of uniting people works in this country, but we're 
And I can't, I mean, look what's going on in Congress today. I mean, look at the insanity. They, you know, they get rid of a speaker for the first time in the history of our country. Huh. They want to defund Ukraine. Here we have a fledging democracy. We're either a superpower or we are not. And here we've got Ukraine who needs our help. And you have Republicans on the Hill saying, no, we're not going to give them any more money. Well, you don't give them money. Let me tell you this. I've been in Ukraine. I've been to the war zone. We don't support them. Game over. And you think Putin's going to stop there? Not a chance. Being in Lithuania, Estonia, I can go through that. You'll spend 10 times more money. So I just, the messaging, every campaign is unique. Everyone's a little bit different. We've got to get this country back together as one. We are the greatest nation on earth. We are the only true superpower today. You look at China, their economy is in real trouble today. We're resilient. And I don't know, Mark and I have spent a lot of time talking about yep. this. It's really, I'm disgusted with the American political system today. I'm disgusted uh, it, it, what's going on. The amount of time we waste on things that don't help people's lives, it, it's just shocking to me. I'm a half glass overflowing kind of guy. And the stuff today about this and that, and, you know, it's awful. Yeah. Was part of Jimmy Carter's problem the messaging? Um, so uh, this brings to memory when I was working on this thing many years ago, um, talking to one of his speechwriters who said, you know, Carter didn't have any of the actor in him like Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan could get before an audience with whom he shares no past common experiences and create a believable sense of empathy, and it was real to them, even though it wasn't real. And Jimmy Carter didn't have that. He said, you can put him in front of an African-American church and talk about his role in civil rights and his commitment to it, and you didn't need to give him a speech. It was authentic, and people felt it, and he was so charismatic when it was something about which he felt it was genuine to him and personal, um, but he didn't have the actor in him. And so the communication, the guy on TV just couldn't do it, you know, the way that Reagan could. Um, and Jimmy so Carter would not do anything, Mark, that he did not believe was the right thing to do. Yeah. He would not say anything. Yeah. He would not pretend. It just, that's not who he was. You know, as I say, he was, you know, Naval Academy, submariner. He was a very serious, smart, but he would never, if someone ever went to him and said, you need to do this in order to help us with boats, he wouldn't do it. He'd go the yeah. other way. Yeah. He always just tried to do what he thought was right, let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. I'm the associate rector of a private Ukrainian university that is directly engaged with uh, President Zelensky's office, okay, for that moment. And I, my question to you is, is because of election, because you cut your teeth on Jimmy Carter's election, and now the Ukrainian government is being going to be faced with President Zelensky, uh, how to have an election or not? given the fact that t almost two-thirds of your population are either IDPs or refugees, and the rest of the country and taken over and blah, blah, blah. You know the story as well as anyone else. How, where, what would you see as how to navigate this very, very, very treacherous terrain? Yeah, so it's a great question. I don't know if many of you are paying attention to the issue. You have Ukrainian elections coming up. Do they have the elections or not have the elections? I just got back from meeting with everybody over there. I, you know, as I say, the biggest argument we have is this is a fledging democracy trying to spread its wings, and they were attacked, and we need to support them. We either the United States of America supporting democracies or we're not, and if we're not, then okay, you know, Quit pretending we're the greatest superpower. I come from a place I'd like to see them have the elections as long as we can ensure that all those people who are on the front lines can vote. And I think they can. I mean, we are, in fairness, as you know, delivering stuff every day to them. You know, I when I was on the front lines, I sat with a gentleman, the commander. He had been there for 16 months, no break, living in a hole in the ground, plywood on top. To me, those fighters, they're the ones we have to ensure. If we can't ensure that they can cast their ballot, then we should push it back a little bit. But I do think the message of an election 
But we also got to be careful. Putin will do everything he possibly can to get in and screw with those elections to make them look false. And that's what we got to be very careful. And we can't be assured of 100% of the security now that we shouldn't have. Let's, let's win the war first yeah. and then deal with everything else after. Be a nice message if we have the election, but first and foremost, we got to beat Putin here. I mean, these people, you know, are fighting their lives out for this. So the governor is supposed to teach a class for us this evening, um, which um, we've run a little bit over, but we work him double time, and he's been just so great to be willing to do this. Terry, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. All right, thank you. Thank you.